today's scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians in the fourth chapter. This is a letter of Paul to a church in Ephesus, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 7 and then skipping to verse 11. It's not because I don't like that uh, little snippet there. It's because it's kind of a parenthesis that Paul has inserted into the letter. Um, Feel free to read it on your own. It just has nothing to do with (laughs) the overall flow of the letter. So I'm just going to... I think you get the point, right? I'm just going (laughs) to... Paul writes, I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gift he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Tucked into the back of our United Methodist hymnal is uh, a series of affirmations of faith. It starts at like number 880 in the hymnal and continues on for several to 889. So there's 10 of them back there. And uh, um, they come from a variety of time periods. They come from a variety of places and contexts. The United Methodist denomination is not one that says, here is the creed and we have to believe all of these things. We actually include a lot of different creeds uh, as a part of our official liturgy. And, and, uh, and I'm really happy and proud about that. Uh, so you can take a look at all those. We're going to kind of focus on one in particular for the next uh, four weeks together. In the Nicene Creed, which is the first one, uh, there's a line about the church, about what we believe about the church. Now, the Nicene Creed is an ancient creed. It was written in 325. Uh, came out of the Council of Nicaea. What the church used to do a lot was sort of get together and uh, talk about what they believe and who Jesus is and what the church is supposed to be and probably had a potluck in there as well. And then they, um, and then they would come up with this creed, this, this sort of statement about what their council had decided. So this is the one that happened in Nicaea. Nicene Creed happened in Nicaea. Not good with titles back then, but um, the Nicene Creed uh, came from 325. And, and we've, we've believed this about the church then for thousands of years. The line says, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So for the next four weeks, we're going to kind of drill into each of those particular words. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, as we talk about the church, what the church is today, and what the church is becoming in the future. So today we're going to talk about one. The church is one. What, do, what does it mean to believe that the church is one? The church is united. It's a good time to be talking about the church. There's a lot happening. There's a great movement of the Spirit that is happening all around the church, literally all around the world. A very productive time. A lot of things are changing. A lot of old forms are fading away and new things are being born. The Holy Spirit is doing some amazing, powerful things right now, all around the world. In fact, there's a name for it. I mean, there's a name for this time. Uh, there's a theologian by the name of Phyllis Tickle. Um, and she, has, uh, she died last fall, but her, her book is called The Great Emergence. Right? She calls it The Great Emergence. There's something emerging right now. And that means we don't really know what it is. 
we who live in the midst of it, you know, we, we can't really identify what it is. Perhaps my grandchildren, right, will look back at this time and be able to see, or maybe my great-grandchildren will be able to look and see and kind of describe what happened. She says this happens every 500 years or so, as a matter of fact, that every 500 years there's a great huge thing that happens. She calls it a rummage sale. The church has a rummage sale and cleans everything out of the basement. Uh, so now is one, and she says 500 years ago we had Martin Luther and the Reformation, his Reformation and then the Reformations that followed that. 500 years prior to that was the great schism in which the Eastern Church and the Western Church divided from one another. And 500 years before that, roughly, is the fall of the Roman Empire and the Council of Chalcedon and the implications that had on the church. 500 years before that is the birth of Jesus. And that kind of changed everything, right? Um, so she kind of sees these 500-year cycles and, and identifies this period as one uh, one of those cycles. And there, there's no question that there's something happening. There's a lot of energy. A lot of people are afraid of it and kind of suspicious of it. Like if it doesn't look like it did when I was a kid, it must be wrong. But there's, but there's a lot of new stuff happening. Uh, and it's not wrong or right. It's just awesome. <laughs> it's just fun and new and exciting. Uh, so it's a great time to be thinking about the church. One of those shifts that is taking place that is pretty fundamental, I mean, it's a pretty big shift, has to do with three words. And the three words are believe, behave, and belong. Now, I didn't invent these three words. This is pretty common to talk about the church in this way. When we talk about unity, being a part of the body of Christ, we used to talk in this priority order, believe, behave, and belong. So in order to become a part of the body of Christ, you had to be taught what to believe. That was first and foremost. That was the highest priority to be taught what to believe. And once you figured that out and had all the catechism memorized and knew what the creed was and knew what the belief was, then next of importance was that you lived your life differently, that your actions, your spiritual practices and your service and that kind of stuff was changed. In other words, your behavior. And that was the next priority. And then third priority was belonging, becoming a part of the church. And you can see that priority lived out in the old Roman Catholic Catechism where you were taught everything during Lent uh, and, and knew what the beliefs were before joining the church and be belonging to the church um, in, on Easter Sunday. That's the way it used to be done for a long, long time. So this pattern of priority, believe first, behave, and then belong, um, one of the fundamental shifts that is happening right now is that this order of priority is completely reversed. That when people are becoming a part of the church, it's not about belief anymore as much as it is about the sense of belonging, about the relationship, about the connections among people, belonging to a body, belonging to something bigger than yourself. We, there's this spiritual but not religious kind of thing going on where everybody realizes there's something else there. There's a bigger than me. There's something there bigger than me. I want to connect to that. I want to belong to that. And that is priority one. Not what do you believe about such and such and such, but to belong to something bigger than me. That's priority one. Priority two is behavior. How do I change my life? Because I belong to this body, how am I going to be different? How am I going to live different? How am I going to help people who need help? How am I going to seek to grow in my faith and change my basic behaviors? Priority three is believe. If we even get to believe, right? Um, uh, it's not as important of a thing. Now, for people who... Uh, are a part of a church for a long, long time. Um, this is hard to get our minds around. I've been a part of a church for 45 years now, as of last Tuesday. 45 years, and, and it's hard for me to think about uh, this. It's a fundamental difference in what it means to be a part of the church, what it means to be one, to be united with the church. That belonging, relationship, that's key, that's crucial, that's what it's all about in this new expression of the church. However, this shift, this fundamental difference in how church is lived, is not that much different from the shift that was happening when Paul himself was writing. Paul was writing to address questions of a fundamental shift in one's relationship with God. And to dramatically oversimplify the situation, there were two groups of people who wanted to be followers of Jesus. There were uh, Jewish people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And so they had years and years of prophecy, uh, and they had the law, 
They had this uh, wonderful, beautiful religious tradition from which they came. And all of that led them to Jesus Christ, who was, in their thought, the Messiah, the one that God had sent, the fulfillment of all this prophecy. But you also had everybody else. And the word for everybody else is Gentile. So you have all the Gentile folks who want to be followers of Jesus. They don't believe all this stuff. They don't have the same set of beliefs that the Jewish Christians did. And so a lot of Jewish Christians said, you can't be a follower of Jesus unless you become a Jew, and then you can be a follower of Jesus. And a lot of Gentile Christians were saying, I just like this Jesus guy. I like what he has to say. I like the message. I like the gospel, and I want to follow. I want to be a part of that. I want to belong to that, right? So Paul is writing to address a very, very similar shift in thinking. Paul is writing to say, you're one. You are one body. You are united. Followers of Jesus, the church of Jesus Christ is one. You can't, it's a descriptive statement. It is one. It's not a prescriptive statement. In other words, it should be one. It's describing it. You are one. <laughs> if you feel like you're divided, that's not, that's your problem. That's your perception, right? Your perception needs to shift because you are one. Because here's what Christ came to do. Paul says earlier in the book of Ephesians, Christ came to do no less than create one new humanity in place of the two. So dramatic, so fundamental is this shift that Paul describes it as the creation of one new humanity from these two groups. By reconciling these two groups to God, Paul therefore reconciles them with one another. And that's what Ephesians is telling the folks. You are one. You are one body. And therefore, here's what you should do about it. Chapter 4 starts out with a therefore. Therefore, live a life that is worthy of that. <laughs> live a life that is worthy of that calling. Live a life that looks like this. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Listen to all that belong language. There's nothing in there about you have to ascribe to one another's belief systems. There is a lot of belong language. This is how you should therefore treat one another because you're in relationship with one another. You are in relationship with one another. This is a new, create, a new humanity that God is creating here. And Paul is describing that profound unity not because they all believed the same thing, but rather in spite of the fact that they believed different things. The unity transcends the differences of opinion. There is one body. There is one body. Not there should be one body, but there is one body. There is one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, there is one Lord and one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. Powerful, powerful words powerful message of unity. When I think about that, when I reflect on the power of Paul's message and the crystal clear message of unity that Paul gives, it, it is amazing to me how much anxiety there is in the church about how different we are from one another. It blows my mind that people get so anxious about our differences. We're not even dealing with Jew and Gentile we're dealing with fellow Christians, sometimes fellow United Methodists, who are so anxious about our differences that it comes out in, in, in not helpful ways. It comes out in, in things that are perceived as, as hateful. It comes out in bitterness. It comes out in anger. It comes out in fear. It comes out in, in doctrines that seek to limit the people's access to God's grace instead of expand it to the world. It comes out in, in a lot of ways that but don't seem to fit in with Paul's very, very clear message of unity that is presented in Ephesians. And we, especially as Methodists, tracing our lineage to John Wesley, should, we should get this. This should be a no-brainer for us. Wesley said it hundreds of years ago. Very, very famously said, though there, uh, where am I? But although a difference in opinions or modes of worship may prevent an entire external union, need it prevent our union in affection? 
Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all doubt, we may. Herein, all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. Wesley's asking the question, can we figure out how to live in harmony together? Can we figure out how to be of one heart, even though we're not of one opinion? You know, we don't all sing in unison with one another. I mean, our hymnal is written in four-part harmony, for goodness sakes, right? You know that uh, a C and a B aren't supposed to like each other? You know this? Like a C and a B are a half step apart, and because they're a half step apart, they're not supposed to get along. And they don't, to be honest with you. They, they don't get along well at all. Right? Uh, you know, like, we don't like that sound. It's a dissonant sound. Here's C by itself. Oh, that's fine. C is fine by itself. Even another C. Oh, that's also fine. Even a chord based on C. Oh, beautiful. But you put a C and a B together, and they sit down together. Uh, it's physics. It's actually... It doesn't, so when you play in unison, the wavelength, it's all about wavelength, dude. Wavelength, uh, they line up in unison and notes. So they actually amplify one another. In fact, in a major chord, the wavelengths line up in such a way that it, and they complement one another. So it actually sounds pleasing to our ears. It's, It's science. But the wavelengths of C and B are off. They don't line up. So we had some technical difficulties with the camera yesterday morning and the battery ran out right when I was making that point. So I want to finish that thought. What I was saying was that a C and a B, if they are played together, they're dissonant. But if we don't let C and B sit down together, we'll lose things like a C major 7 chord, which is a beautiful, beautiful chord. And in fact, the energy that's created in the dissonance of the C and the B actually enhances that chord. Not to mention the fact that if we didn't let C and B exist in the same chord together, like a hundred 1950s doo-wop songs would be without an ending, right? Some of us sing in unison with one another. Our wavelengths are exactly aligned. Some of us are part of a major chord. We sound really good together. Our wavelengths are compatible. But some of us are like C and B. There's a lot of dissonance between us. But to be the church, we've got to let all of those notes ring together. It enhances the beauty of the chord. The energy that's created between people who are different from one another actually makes the whole thing more beautiful. That's what it means to be one. That's what it means to be united in Christ. It doesn't mean that we're going to see things the same all the time. It means that when we don't, we can figure out how to be in the same place together, how to be the church together, the church that God truly wants us to be.